of two iconic actors, and I want you to shout out their names if you know who they are. Now instinctively, y'all gonna wanna name the guy that you're gonna see on the left. And that's okay, but that's cheating, because that's easy. What I wanna know is the name of the guy on the right. Okay, you with me? The guy on the left's fine, that's a bonus, you can shout it if you want, but I need people to shout out the name of the guy on the right. You with me? Not if you're with me? Got it? All right, in three, two, one, here we go. Okay, all right. Who'd I hear over there? Was this a uh, con? All right, okay. Who's the guy on the left? Aaron Support, that's right. Who's the guy in the middle? <laughs> you don't know. Don't act like, oh, that's Bob. No, you don't know. I, nobody knows. He's an extra or something. All right. Most of us, if you're over, let's say if you're over 50, you might know Sean Connery from something else. But if you're 50 and under, pretty much only know Sean Connery as Indiana Jones' dad, right? In The Last Crusade. Great movie, awesome, holy grail, all that stuff. But those who are a little older know that Sean Connery played a different role first. A legendary role, an iconic role. Shout it out, who is it? Bond. You got it, you're so smart. The name's Bond, James Bond, the suave British debonair guy. And I tell you what, this guy was born to play this role. It fit him like a glove. Tell me, y'all wonder where I'm going with this. I'm going somewhere spiritual already. Are you ready for this? It fit him like a glove. In fact, he did Bond movie after Bond movie, and it was like, it was synonymous. James Bond, Sean Connery, that's who James Bond is. And then he shocked the world in 1971. He was doing press for Diamonds Are Forever, one of his best movies. And then he said, this is the last time. Missy knows, bye-bye. I'm done. I'm done playing James Bond. I will never play this role again. I'm done. And with that, he walked away from the most iconic role that was built for him. And the world was sad. And they tried unsuccessfully to replace him, get another James Bond. They had different guys come and go, but none of them fit the role like Sean. But here's the part a lot of people don't know. I was reading in my David Jeremiah little Eve E devotional comes in, and he pointed this out a little bit. He said, did you know that Sean Connery actually had trouble playing other roles too? In fact, after a series of movie flops and an and empty bank account, Sean Connery shocked the world, broke his own promise, and came back and played 007 one more time. Ironically, in a movie called Never Say Never Again, <laughs> right? And he's back, playing the role that fit him perfectly. And guys, similar to that, I believe God has a role for you. He has a purpose for us that fits us like a glove that we were made for, custom made. So welcome back to week two of our series, People of Purpose. Last week, we saw this truth. You were created on purpose for a purpose. You're not an accident, not just cosmic chance, little amoebas running around, bumping into each other, and slowly we stood up, we shaved, and here we are, homo sapiens, just no purpose, bandering around, I eat worms. No, that's not it. You were created as a masterpiece. You have a purpose. So today we start discovering what that purpose is. Next week we learn how to live out our individual purposes together as the body of Christ. And then in our final week, I want to share what it looks like to fully embrace God's purpose for our lives, all right? So if you're ready, let's dive into Ephesians chapter 2. We start in verse 8. Take a look with me here. It says this, for it is by your works that you have been... No, no. But this is what we kind of believe. That's not what God's word said. It says, for it is by grace you've been saved, through faith. And this, not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not by works. Why? So that you can't boast about it. It's not about us. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And you remember, if you missed last week or if you caught the replay, we, we look at this question what does it look like for us to fulfill our purpose, to complete the good works that God has, to use our unique talents, our unique abilities, our personalities, our life experiences? What would it look like if we used those, submitted them into the Lord Jesus to be his handiwork, to do good works, the works he had prepared in advance? Because you are saved for a great purpose. 
And we see in the scriptures, you're not saved by your works. You are saved to do good works. We're not just supposed to sit around. You have a purpose. And today I am praying that God will show you or maybe affirm for you what your purpose is. What is your role? William Barclay has this great quote. He's often credited by saying this. Maybe you've heard it. He says, there are two great days in a person's life. The day we're born <laughs> and the day we find out why. Isn't that great? There's a lot of truth in that. There's another great quote that kind of goes right along with it from Ken Nicholas. says this, joy comes from doing what you are made to do. I mean, we all want joy, right? So what are we made to do? If you're a follower of Christ, your job is to do good works, to bring glory to God. These are works he's prepared in advance for you. But the truth is, most people in this world, they have no idea what their purpose is. They have no idea what those good works are. How do you even find out? I mean, that, that blows my mind when you think about it. Probably the most revolutionary question you can ask, why am I here? God, what do you want me to do? And most people never even dig deep enough to find out the answer. Except you. Ah, you're here. And God's word actually doesn't leave us flying blindly. There is some incredible stuff. We're going to get so practical today, you are going to love it. This is our reason for being, all right? So as long as you don't know the good works, you're going to struggle. It's going to feel like you're wearing a suit that just doesn't quite fit right. You ever had one of those? When your mom puts it on, that little fake tie? You got to go pose for those awkward Easter photos? Oh, man, I remember that. And no, I'm not going to show you one of those. Don't you do it, Leanne. It's kind of like uh, driving a Lamborghini. But instead of racing it down the street like you're supposed to, you end up taking it as an Uber or a taxi, right? The reason there's an entire YouTube channel that's a prank is because it is so ludicrous for you to call an Uber and a guy bebops down your street at four miles an hour and says, come on in. And it's just so, it doesn't fit. That Lamborghini was, that's heresy. You can't do that. It was made for something greater, guys, and so were you. We learned last week the Greek word for handiwork that he used here is poema, a very powerful word that literally means a masterwork. It's where we get our English word poem from. So God is the master poet creating his master poem. You are his poem. You are his poema. You're not an accident. He has lovingly handcrafted you, shaped you, seeing your days, knowing what he needed you to accomplish. So we've established that. Now the question is, why? Why did God custom make you? Are we all supposed to do the exact same thing? We know last week we're not served and saved just to sit. We're not supposed to just be parked in the garage and admired once a week. We're not supposed to be even a pretty piece of artwork we hang on the wall. We're created to serve a purpose, God's poema. We're created to do good works. Certainly not evil works, some of us do. Certainly not even neutral works, some of that's okay. But you are created to do good works. This world is a better place because you are in it. You have a purpose, a divine purpose that God has created. So let me ask, do you know the good works that God's called you to do? If you don't, you are in the right place on the right day. Who are the people that God has put around you that you could help? What is your mission? What is your unique sphere of influence? Who is around you that you can help? Or who is around you that you can be a blessing to? Maybe that only you can help. All right, let me put this in kind of practical illustrations here. A lot of, a lot of you like me say, you know, Pastor, I, I don't really get out much. I don't really know that many people. If I'm being honest, I don't, I don't really like people. <laughs> Especially past COVID, everybody's just weird. People like never get out of their pajamas and they go stand at Walmart. It's just weird. The world's weird. You know what I'm talking about? The world's great, except it's just too people-y. <laughs> you know, other than that, I just, I love the world. Pastors, is there, is there, like, is there hope for me? I don't really run it. Yeah, there is. You know what? I have a hard time meeting people outside of church, too. So I had to say, God, you're going to have to open my eyes. And here's a perfect illustration of something that kind of slapped me upside the head. And I just about missed it. But I want to show you how you can see where your sphere of influence is in a mundane, everyday way. Anyone recognize this picture right here? Yeah, yeah, you can shout it out if you know. Anybody recognize that? It's not too far from here. Mm hmm. Jordan Lake, right? Campground out that way. <clears throat> Milo and I, we like to take camper out. Don't be too impressed. 
we, uh, we set it up, and then we go back home, and we shower. Then we come back, <clears throat> tinker around a little bit, light the fire. Then we go to Hardy's and get dinner. <laughs> and, and then we come back. <clears throat> and then uh, we probably check on the dogs. We drive home, <laughs> get another shower, because it got sweaty. Okay? <laughs> Let dogs out, and then we go back to the camper. So, you know, spend about six hours at night in the dark, right? This is how we kill. But because of this, every time we come through this little gate, we see the same you can't really see it. Behind that area reserved, no public, there's this little lonely eight by eight shack. And there was a lady there, an older lady, who, I'm just going to be quite honest, she was as cuddly as a cactus. <laughs> right? You know the people that have the personality of a sunburn, and you're not really sure, like, should I hug you, or do you just want to be left alone? You don't really know. And I remember Milo and I were like, oh, boy, she's not really friendly. She, is she mad at us? Like, oh, well, thank you. And we go by. And then we see her again, and then again, and then and finally, I was like, Do we, "Is there no other workers in Jordan Lake? This lady hates us." And then it hit me, bro. This is your mission field. I am putting you in contact with. It. She is in your path. You've got the gift of communication. You ain't said a word about me. And I looked at Milo. We drove off and said, "I think this lady is in our path for a purpose, Milo." <laughs> Help me, Lord Jesus. This is going to be a tough one. So if we came back to her, I said, I said, hey, man, what is your name, ma'am? She said, my, and she told her name. I don't want to say it. And I, and I remembered it because it reminded me of her car. And her car was there. And I looked. And on that car, on the back, were bumper stickers. Every, every bumper sticker you could think of that would make me mad. <laughs> like, she was on the total opposite end of everything I have held dear. And I was like, oh, Lord, you can't be, this can't be real. This, this is the one you're going to put in my path? Come on. What about some saved fish? I just bring them to the aquarium here. You know, like, you know, no, no, you're going to go. You know how much I love to fish, Hayden. So I look at Milo, I'm like, we're going to have to pray for this lady. We're going to have to pray for ourselves. We go camp, and we come back by, and she was, there, she was there every single time. And finally, one day, I remember looking at her, and I said, I said, ma'am, we keep crossing paths. I said, is there anything we can do for you? You know, how are you doing it? She said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hanging in there. And she said, are you going to be camping again tonight? I said, I am. Even though it looks like we're going home and showering and changing and bringing back drive through we are going to camp here tonight. She said, it's going to get cold tonight. Let me show you something. She had us get out of the truck. She opened up this little box, and there was firewood. And I said, oh, no, I know you sell the firewood. I just don't have any money. Like, I am broke. I, got, I gave you my last cash, 33 bucks to rent this spot tonight. She said, no, no, no. You see the loose wood? It's yours. For free. I'm like, no. Really? So I take it. I'm like, and I, I got Milo here. Milo's eyes lit up because he is a pyro. And he's like, that's free? So I hand it to Milo, we got free firewood. We're going to have a real fire. I'm not one of them cheap logs I buy at Walmart. You like the wrapper and stuff, right? I, I know, I'm so bad. I hand the wood to him, and I said, thank you. So she said, oh, what, look, this one, this little, this little thing is broken, too. Oh, look at that. There's some more free wood. I said, you don't have to do that. She said, take it. Y'all, this brought her so much joy. We'd never seen this. As we began to talk with her, we saw this gruff exterior begin to melt. And I saw this tender heart. And I said, Man, what is your favorite candy? Is there something we can bring you? And she says, oh, every woman loves chocolate. I said, say no more. Got in the car, put the firewood away, we went back, bought her some candy bars. When we came back, she was gone. It was a couple days later, our paths finally crossed. Still had the candy in the truck. Hadn't melted, it was getting cold out. And I said, oh, here, I said, I got something for you. And I handed her a candy bar. And she started to cry. She started to get choked up. I'm like, you don't have to eat it. If you if you know what? She said, this is so sweet. I said, are you okay? She said, well, I just, I just got some bad news. I got a call from my doctor. And the test came in. And she didn't finish her sentence. And I said, say no more. Said, we're we're going to pray for you. And, and we, we made some small talk. Another car came up behind. I couldn't just linger. and stuff. So we drove to our campsite. And I'm thinking, we're going to put that woman on the blessing tree. Out here in the lobby. We're going to come back, and we're going to invite her to Christmas Eve service. And we're going to show her that Jesus loves her. And we're going to, you know, this is a girl I thought was going to be the one that I bless, right? She ends up blessing me. 
She ends up, y'all, this is how it works. She was in my path. I could use a little gift of gab that I have, my uniqueness, my weird quirky that you know, and I could engage her. And I watched God soften her heart. What about you? Where is your little path? Is it Starbucks? Is it drive through McDonald's? My wife, she knows everybody at this McDonald's right over here by United Church. Ooh. I remember going through last week, true story, and I pulled up a cranky old lady, but I know Amy knows her. She didn't recognize me without Amy. She's like, eh, $7. I'm like, hey. She's like, hey. I'm like, you, Amy's not here. She is in Amy's sphere of influence. You know what I did? True story. I grabbed my phone and I opened the picture of her. I'm like, I'm her husband. <laughs> what a nerd, right? Y'all, she lit up. She goes, oh, Amy. We love Miss Amy. She, how's she doing? And I was like, are you kidding me? This is unbelievable. Right? No love, no respect, guys. But that was her sphere of influence. She has made an impression on these people. We've seen some of those workers show up here because we're starting to build these bridges, just loving them right where they're at. So I want you to have a gut check moment and ask yourself, what would it look like if I went about my day looking for others' interests before my own? Because most of us, this is natural. This isn't to beat us up. Most of us are concerned about our personal agenda first. We wake up, that's what we do. We have to resist that, to follow Christ and say, you know what? I want to serve your purpose, not mine. Your will be done, not mine. Because as long as I'm serving my purpose, I'm unsatisfied. I'm missing the boat. I'm wearing that suit that just doesn't quite fit. Y'all, some people spend 30 or 40 years climbing the wrong ladder, the ladder of human success. And they get to the top and they realize they've spent their whole life climbing the wrong ladder. They spent their whole life climbing the ladder of success when they should have been climbing the ladder of purpose. So your next truth is this. Don't climb the ladder of success. Climb the ladder of purpose. I'm going to have my helpers here. I got a, <clears throat> got a little illustration I want to show you guys. This is going to be kind of fun. If you're, if you're manning the camera, you're going to have to pan over here. And uh, don't worry, we're coming back. And... Uh, I'm hoping this will be an illustration that you take with you and you will never forget. And not because I fall. <clears throat> All right. So we've got two ladders. Two ladders in this world. The ladder of human success and the ladder of godly purpose. Oh, boy, this is a big ladder. This looked a lot smaller when I thought about it. Okay. All right. Awesome. Slide it this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good, good. Right. Nice. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. All right, don't go too far. You might need to catch me. All right. Most of us are raised focusing on this ladder, the ladder of success. Don't feel bad. We all do. Schools teach us this. What do you do? Work hard, get good grades, go to school, get a good degree, get a good high-paying job, get a nice big house, white picket fence. Two and a half dogs, kids, whatever. We know it. And so what we do is we start climbing this ladder. I'm like, okay, this is good. And we get up like, oh, you know what? I want a little bit more of this. I got some success. But then God starts tugging at your heart and thinking, gosh, I feel like I'm just kind of using all my time, energy, and talent on me. And then you see the spiritual ladder over here. And you're like, oh, yeah. This isn't too bad. But this ladder's easier. You know what? I think I'd rather just climb this. And you get a little higher, and you're thinking, you know what? Maybe, maybe I should not turn my back on God. Maybe I should do something a little more spiritual. You know what? I'm just going to, ah, this is nice. I'll just kind of have one foot in both worlds. And your theme song becomes Van Halen. I want the best of both worlds. No, no, okay, all right. And you think, I could just do this. In fact, if I just keep one foot Oh, <laughs> on each ladder, <laughs> you're all scared to death, aren't you? <laughs> it's just one problem with this. It's scary. <laughs> There's another problem with this. After a while, I'm starting to get uncomfortable. Dare I say, miserable. 
You know why? Because you can't serve two masters. But we try to do it. We all do. I do it. Man, I have my whole life planned out. By the time I was 16, I knew exactly what God needed to do for me, <laughs> right? And I thought, you know what? I could go one more. No, I don't think. I? No? All right. Y'all get this? Get your picture? All right, I'm coming down. Whew. That was high. I want to ask you, be honest. This is just you and the Lord now. There's no, no shame here. We're all in the same boat. Which ladder are you climbing? See, I, I, I had it all figured out. Seriously, I had three things in my mind. I'm like, you know what? I had three big, incredibly shallow goals. The first thing I wanted to be is I wanted to be a rock star. And that was it. And I, was, I was well on my way. And that's me in the middle with hair and everything. And I was like, if I could just have these two things, I'd be a rock star. I'm going to make a lot of money. I'm going to marry a smoking hot wife. <laughs> that was my, I got one of them, right? See? That was my three goals. So shallow, so superficial. And I kept going at But then God started tugging on my heart. I became a Christian, but I was like still had one foot on each ladder, right? I would go on. The shows got bigger. The hair got bigger. And the crowds began to get bigger. And I mean, the success was starting to roll. It was starting to negotiate a record deal that would be unbelievable money. Everything was going great until it happened. God showed up and messed everything up. And I'm so glad he did. Because he took my shallow, superficial, goofy dreams. Right? If you want to make God laugh, tell him, your, tell him your plans and your dreams. And I spent my life climbing the wrong ladder. And then all of a sudden, God starts saying, hey, I gifted you with all this. Are you going to use it all on yourself? Are you going to do anything for it? And God, praise him for it. He took me from this path to this path right here. And within a week's time, I surrendered. I quit the band, blew them away, broke their heart. I still remember them crying up in our house. It's like the wheels came off for them. And in my life, it was quite terrifying. And I remember literally the next Sunday, I went to a church. If you haven't heard my testimony, I, I, I listened to it and, and I went down the aisle and I talked to the pastor after church. He stayed a long time. I had long hair, hippie, you know, heavy metal guy. And I said, I don't know what God wants to do with me but can you use this at all? <laughs> and he smiled and he said, oh, brother, you are in the right. This is an older man, about to retire. He could have judged me. I mean, I look like, you know, like we think of the next generation. I was that generation. You know what I'm talking about? He's looking at me. He didn't judge me. He embraced me and he met with me and mentored me. Little did I know he was setting me up to replace him as he moved to the mission field in another country. It was incredible. When I look back and I see what God's doing. In fact, I went down and I said, you know what? I want to declare I'm all in. And I said, I want to be baptized. Maybe you need to do that. To say whose team you're on. In fact, we're going to be doing that. Coming up here on uh, Sunday, what is it? The uh, 4th? Maybe you need to make a clean break with the past. And say, you know what? I declare I'm all in. I'm done with this. I'm done climbing the easy ladder. And I want to get on God's ladder. I want to climb the right mountain. So if that's you, maybe come talk to me after church. Maybe it's time to, to have that clean break. I would much, much rather be about serving God's purpose than fulfilling my own selfish desires any day of the week. I have not regretted it. I am so glad he messed up my plans. And now I'm praying God will mess you up. <laughs> Sounds weird, doesn't it? <laughs> praying God will mess up your plans. You know, he has a purpose for you. In fact, go back and look at the anchor verse again. It says, for we are God's handiwork, Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Let that sink in. Did you catch that? Before you were born, he was knitting you together in your mother's womb with good works specifically in mind. That means he was creating you, designing you with the end result in mind. He's like, I'm going to need Carter to do this and this and this. So I'm going to add a sprinkle of this temperament. Ed needs to be able to do this. So I'm going to sprinkle in a little bit of this gifting. And he's like a master potter who knows he wants to make a vase to hold flowers, knowing in the end result he had the purpose in mind before he created it. Think about that. The function of the pottery determined its shape, your giftedness. And the same is true for you. You are shaped to accomplish 
a unique purpose, right? So let's give you a real life example. This is just out there. I want to help us brainstorm, sit back and relax. We just want to think outside of the box how this might look. Let's say God had a purpose to bring clean drinking water to a remote village, pick a, uh, somewhere in the middle of Africa, okay? Let's say he wanted to do that. And God said, you know what? First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a linguist, someone who can go over there, learn their language, learn their customs, and then come back and translate this so that we can communicate effectively. And then I'm going to handcraft and create a doctor who can go over there and diagnose what's been going wrong, why are they chronically sick, what's happening, and see that they have a desperate need for clean drinking water. And then I'm going to create an engineer who is gifted in all the engineering things, and he is going to create a portable well driller that can go over there on site and dig a well on their land for fresh, clean drinking water. And then I'm going to create a teacher to go and show these people how to use the well, who can communicate effectively with them. And then I'm going to create a businessman who knows the inner workings of banking and different things, how to make profit so they can turn it around and invest in their own community and they can bless others in their nearby villages. And then I'm going to create a mechanic to fix the well when it inevitably breaks outside its warranty. Right? And then God said, I'm going to make a call center so that you can get a call saying, we've been trying to reach you about your extended warranty. I'm kidding. God is not going <laughs> to... You know, you got those calls. You see this? And then God said, you know what, I'm going to make a missionary to go and talk to them about the well that never runs dry and tell them what it means to have living water springing up. Because we've met their physical needs, and now we can meet their spiritual needs. You know what's beautiful about that illustration? I just covered about 50 people in this room. And not one person did everything. Did you notice that? They each had their own role. Like scripture says, you have a hand, a foot. Just be your part in the kingdom. You don't have to do it all. You don't have to be overwhelmed and say, God, I can't do it. I don't know what to do. Not one person did it all. Each person played their specific role. And you don't have to pretend to be something you're not and carry that burden. Be you. Your unique gifts. Your unique shape. You don't have to fake it till you make it. You don't have to be a poser. Anybody remember that word? Man, that guy's just a poser. There's a great quote from Bill Muntz. He says this, the beauty of God's workmanship isn't displayed in posing. The beauty can only be displayed when we are put to work fulfilling his purpose in us. Isn't that great? I believe we are most satisfied when we are serving the Lord. And it does not have to be a pastor. It doesn't even have to be in a church. Did you know that all work is sacred if you do it as unto the Lord. God has you where you are possibly to be that sphere of influence. Or maybe today is the day, and when you see here in just a second, some of these questions were going that he say, you know, he's tugging me over here. And I needed that nudge. And I'm not going to be afraid anymore. And I'm going to take this step of faith. Where has God got you in this, okay? I mean, how awesome would it feel to wake up and say, I know I am doing exactly what God put me on this earth to do. And my prayer today is that each of you would be able to say that. Remember, all work is sacred when you do it as unto the Lord. All work is redeemed. You are there for a reason, right? And I don't know all the good works God's got for you to do. I wish I did. I wish I could just come out and say, he's got this, you know. Maybe it's something you've never thought of. Maybe your blessing and your giftedness is a temperament for children. And God's calling you to foster children, to take them out of an abusive environment. Maybe it's helping Ukrainian refugees fleeing a war-torn country, and they pop on a plane, and they find themselves in the triangle, and they don't know anybody. But you have an open bedroom, and you have the gift of hospitality. Maybe it's making sure no child in Wake County goes to bed hungry. Maybe it's serving online, social media, or maybe photography, and you're trying to inspire people for action. You're reminding them of scriptures of God's truth, their plan. You're giving them a kind word because you have a free moment to do that, and you're gifted with technology. Maybe it's using musical gifts to minister and bless. Maybe it's serving unseen in some back room, taking care of kids so that parents who are worn out and at their wit's end can have an hour to rest in the word, to worship. Whatever your purpose is, guys, I really, really, really am praying 
that you will be serious this week to pray and ask God. Remember, two greatest moments in life, the moment you're born and the moment you find out why. So I want to leave you with four areas that can help you discover your purpose, okay? The four areas often intersect with each other, and we're going to walk through these, and, and it's going to be awesome. It's going to, it's going to blow your mind, and I'm actually going to let you take a copy of this home with you. The first area is this. The area is that which you love. I want you to start asking yourself, what is it that I love? The second area, that which the world needs. Ooh, man, now you're getting real. Start talking about mission now. Then there's that which you can be paid for. <laughs> now you're talking. And then there's that which you're good at. Your gifts, your temperament, your personality traits. If, if you're like me, you're a visual guy, it might help to see this in a diagram form. Okay, so I've got a diagram for you, and we'll just kind of look at this. All right, first you've got that which you love. See how this kind of overlaps with your passion and your mission. Then there's that which the world needs, as this is your mission. It could be a vocation at this point. That which you could be paid for. Now you've got a vocation that intersects. Now I'm talking about a profession. Maybe there's something I could do. And there's that which you're good at. You're passionate about it. It's your profession. You may want to take a picture of this and, and look at this, because I'm going to have you ask three questions that when you go home this week. And I want you to write inside these circles some of the things that come to mind. All right? I'm not saying this exercise is going to reveal to you tomorrow everything that, that God has for, for your journey in life. But I will tell you this. It will begin your journey to discovery. Instead of just flying blind, just waking up in the morning, putting your pants on, going to work, punching a clock, coming home tired, going to bed, doing it up, get it, rinse and repeat. And then I'm going to ask you to pray and ask God a very specific series of questions in this prayer. Your challenge this week is to really think through this. What are the common threads? Start looking at how you could combine what you're good at with what you love to do. And you could discover some unique passions. You know, maybe you love to cook. Okay, you know what, I love to cook. But I really want to serve others. Well, you know what, I, I think I'm going to cook a meal and I'm going to provide meals for those who are hungry. And this week, I'm not just going to wonder about it. I'm actually going to take it down to the rescue mission. And I'm going to give this meal, no strings attached, no fee, do it. and I'm going to do this for a period of weeks, and then maybe they call you back and go, hey, your, your casserole is such a hit. Can we give you a stipend, and you just do this for us? And you're like, absolutely. I would love nothing more. Maybe you're retired, and this is a gift for you. You could do it. You see how it is? This is? You just start thinking out of the box. How do I combine what I'm good at to where I could be paid? And then God might have it to where something's on your heart, the world needs. You discover all these things combined, and you have a unique mission. And over time, this is your vocation, your purpose, your ministry. God has you blooming, but it takes prayer and reflection, and, and you put your experiences in, you mix it all together, you see God start to merge these things, and it reveals some custom-made purposes that you might have overlooked, or you might have just been like me, and you climbed the ladder that everybody climbs, because we go to school, we pay our fees, get our C's, and we graduate, we learn the secret handshake from the guy with the diploma at the end of the stage, <sighs> and we go punch the time clock. You know, if that's all I think about work, that's all I'm going to get out of it. God might have you there for a missionary moment. There might be some divine calling. That might be the booth that you drive by at Jordan Lake and you think, this guy, I can't stand my boss. He's so cranky. He's ugly. He's mean. But there's something behind that gruff exterior. I don't know all the good works that God has for you. I won't pretend to. But he does. And in James... We see this. He says, ask for wisdom. If any of you lacks wisdom, ask God. And he gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to you. Ask God for wisdom to discern and discover your unique purposes. Now, I love practical preaching, guys. That's me. I'm more of a teacher than a preacher. And when, I, when I started diving into this and preparing some of these things, I said, you know what? This week during your quiet time, I'm going to give you three questions I want you to ask. So take a picture of these if you want. The first question I want you to ask this week is, what things do you love to do? Okay, this, is, this is a heart level evaluation. The second question I want you to ask during your quiet time is, what areas of need stir that heart? What is it that you see oh, just moves you, just grabs you right here? Right? The third question I want you to ask during your quiet time this week, what areas are you gifted in? You see this right here? You've got your heart your mission, and your talents. When you start answering this and you start writing it down, 
You start getting three or four things. You start filling in circles like, you know what? This is what I'm good at. I'm good at. Ask your spouse. They know what you're good at. <laughs> they know what you're not. And start writing these down, okay? So I'm going to take a picture of this you want, and I'm going to send you home. I've got uh, uh, over, uh, over plenty for, for this entire room to take one of these home, okay? So when we dismiss today, we're going to have a couple people standing in different places, and I want you to come and don't leave without one of these. Because at the bottom of it, there's a prayer. And I want us to pray this prayer every day. Can you imagine this entire church, those people streaming? I'll, I'll try to snap a picture, put this up for you. And we're all praying a prayer of unity and like-mindedness, asking the Lord of creation to reveal and confirm his purpose in our life. We serve a heavenly father who wants nothing more than to reveal that too. Remember, he's not coy, he's not hiding. I know the perfect thing for you but I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> Can you imagine? That's not the God we serve. So I want you to pray and seek answers. Wrestle with these questions. Think about the ways God has combined the giftedness, the passions, and the needs. What do you love to do? This isn't rocket surgery. You can do this. And then I want you to pray. All right? So I've used up all my time. I'm going to let you out a couple minutes early. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to have my volunteers. Uh, here, Milo, why don't you take... 20 of those, and uh, Elliot, I'm going to give you some of these. And James, if you want to take these back to the back and have those in the lobby, we're going to stand, and I want you to come and find one of these three guys, and I want you to truly take this to heart. This is your homework assignment, okay? All right, so let's stand together. I'm going to pray a prayer over you. We're going to be dismissed. We'll crank up the music, and I'll be around if you want to talk through this. And uh, I'm so excited to see what God is going to do in our hearts as we open them to him and to his purposes. All right, let's bow together and as we pray. Heavenly Father, we may not know the full details, your whole purpose, your whole plan for us, but I do know that you do not desire to keep it hidden. You created us on purpose, for a purpose. We know your scripture just read to us that uh, you have prepared works in advance for us to do. Father, this week we pray that you would give us wisdom to discover, to understand, and to live out these purposes that you have for us. Help us to be on your page. God, let us climb the right ladder. And if we're off base, Lord, if we're on the wrong ladder, nudge us gently onto your path. We love you. We thank you for allowing us the privilege to pray and ask for wisdom, as you said. You're so good to us. Go with us now. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's church said, amen. And amen. God bless you guys. I hope you're enjoying this. I will see you at either small groups or next Sunday. Make sure you get a page. <laughs>